All right. John chapter 13. John chapter 13. Uh, I, I don't play to roam around today. I usually don't roam around. But if I roam around for a minute or so, you might not be bothered. But sometimes I wonder how much of this sinks in when I preach. You know, uh, did anybody go to lunch right now? You know, how many he's preaching? I used to have one guy, he'd say, uh, now open your Bibles. And he'd go like this. <laughs> <laughs> then as soon as the sermon was over, I'd say, let us pray. And he would go, okay, he'd try it out. You know? <laughs> oh, like clockwork. Clockwork, every service. Every service was the same. Now, I hope you don't go out to lunch right now. <clears throat> And say, well, you know, we don't want the preaching to be for nothing, for, for no reason at all. We want it to sink in. Now, last week, I prepared this sermon for last week. But we had five inches of snow. I had 4,000 pounds on my flat roof. I shoveled off. We had, no, we had power here, but one of the phases were sort of out so that I don't think we had any furnaces and the lights were clear. And the emergency lights were trying to charge. And then finally uh, used all the batteries up. So I thought, well, if I if we had service, and I knew that everybody was going to be out plowing, then I was going to preach this again. And uh, there's this a game called the Book of Authors. Anybody ever heard of the book uh, the Book of uh, Authors? It's a card game. Man. Yes. Listen. Uh, uh, Mary just bought us in the 1890s. Was it the 1891? It's the same as Parker Brothers, and I wanted it, but that's where I learned this. I said, I'm going to preach, this. I'm going to have to preach the sermon twice. And it's like, uh, Tales Twice Told. And I, I haven't thought about that title in years. Now, now, well, how he, he's older, he knows that. Folks, it was probably written in the 1700s. I did not live in the 1700s. And, and, and so on. So, but I thought, well, I'm going to preach this twice, but now that you're all here, I'm going to preach it once. And, um, but for me, I'll, what I'm going to preach this morning, for me, I only have to think of these things for just a little while. I only have to think about this for a little while. Meaning, I could die this year, I could die 30 years from now. But for you that are younger, your conscience, your conscience is going to have to live with this a whole lot longer. Those that are younger, you're going to have to live with this a whole lot longer than me and my wife. You're going to have to think about these things. So our title is one word with a question mark. One word with a question mark, and how did I arrive at it? Lately, I've just been randomly opening up my Bible when I'm pre prepping, and I said, well, there it is, we'll preach on that. But I thought I'd preach on the word happy. Now, happy is it a Bible word. Is fun a Bible word? Fun is not a Bible word. God doesn't care if you're having fun. All right, fun is not a Bible word. Is happy a Bible word? Happy is a Bible word. Now, just recently, I heard somebody talking about it, saying, "Well, happiness is in, in the Bible." Well, folks, happiness is in the Bible. Happy is in the Bible. It's a Bible word, and there's different things that make a person happy. And usually, it's negative. It's something that's negative that makes a person happy. I mean, you would think that, but but it's generally true in, in biblical. So our title this morning is Happy. I want you to turn to this. I didn't tell you where to turn. Uh, we're going to get be to our third or fourth page before I get to the text. It's John chapter 13. Now, I have preached on this uh, topic, not on happiness, not on, on happy, but in this area about four or five times in the 20-some years we've been here. 
And uh, the last time I did it, we, we literally did it, it's, it's foot washing. We literally did a foot washing. Folks, we don't believe in, in it as an ordinance. As a Mennonite, while well, I was in the Mennonite, I was, I was, when I was really little, five, six years old, I was, I was a Mennonite. Now, what brand of Mennonite, I can't tell you. And then later, where I'd gotten saved in my 30s, we were in the Mennonite Church, and there's like six brands of them. We were what I would call, I, I would consider two brands, there's like a half a dozen brands. We would have been in what I would call reform. They, they were no different than any other person. And they performed it, and they accepted it as an ordinance. So we, we do communion, this would have been a good sermon for communion. Communion and baptism, they also believe in foot washing. And they do that as an ordinance. Now, I don't believe Jesus taught it as a practice, as you and I to do that. But the last time I did it, I don't know if I asked for volunteers. Uh, uh, we had a certain guy here that had come for quite some time. I won't, because we're on camera here, I won't mention his name, but he volunteered. I wasn't going to deny him. He wanted to uh, part participate in the book. I think, I think Rich, you did. I think you were here, and I think you participated in, in it. Uh, we had probably a half a dozen. Uh, maybe Buster was in it. Uh, I was doing the foot washing, and we had a shocker, man. But are you happy? For some of you, you're, you're, not, you're not happy. You are not happy. And I know you're not. But I'd like to think that you will pay attention this morning in order that you can be happy. The different ways to obtain this, this is one of these ways, in order to be happy. Happy? Are you happy? Father, now bless the sermon. Bless the preaching. Uh, I pray for the believer to put this to practice. That all of us put into practice. In Christ's name, amen. This ought to help everybody in their relationships. Every last person here. Happy? Are you happy? Must happiness be defined? Happiness is defined, we can look it up in the, encycl uh, the dictionary, happiness is defined by good fortune and pleasure. That which is a feeling. It is a feeling. We are, we are emotional beings. We have feelings. That which is a feeling of satisfaction and gratification. Such a feeling is a feeling in which all seek, yet few find. All men, all, I don't care if you're lost or saved, all men, women, boys and girls, they all seek this. Who doesn't want to be happy? It's a feeling which all seek, but few find. Happiness is a reward in life. You are rewarded for this. A reward most welcome and desired by all. Yet like all rewards in life, there, there always must be the requirement to receive the reward. The requirement to receive the reward. I'll give you an example. We don't have a lot of verses here today, but you'll recognize them as I say them. Here's an example. That if any would not work, neither should he eat. I mean, this is simple, folks. This is simple, not hard to get. That if any would not work, neither should he eat. If one wants the reward, he must fulfill the requirement. The reward is eating. Eating. The requirement is working. Pretty simple. It sounds rather simple, doesn't it? And so it is. And it is quite practical. This is practical preaching. People understand such things and practice such things when the reward outweighs the requirement. When the reward outweighs the requirement, they seek they see that. They, they fulfill it. The reward eating then outweighs the requirement of working. So since it outweighs the requirement of working, they go ahead and work. 
get the reward because they want to eat. Most likely, the urgency of the reward dictates the fulfilling of their requirement. Uh, let's take salvation as an example. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. So everlasting life is the reward. Those that believe, the reward is everlasting life. Going to be with Jesus in glory. Believeth on the Son is the requirement. See, the reward and the requirement. I'll say it again. Everlasting life is the reward, and believeth on the Son is the requirement. But sad to say, most, most men and women don't feel the urgency. They don't feel urgent about it. It's not like an emergency to them. This afternoon's meal is more of an, an emergency to them. See? They don't feel the urgency. And since men do not feel the urgency, few there be that find it. Straight is the gate, narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. <clears throat> the reward is life... We'll give another example. Straight is the gate, narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life. The reward is life, and the requirement is the gate, going through the gate, the straight gate, the narrow way, which is Jesus. Knowledge of the requirement is a far cry from the receiving of the reward. See, the requirement for eating is working. You can have knowledge of it, but you don't receive it unless you, you Perform, perform the requirement. So knowledge of the requirement is a far cry from the receiving of the reward. Eight souls were saved alive by responding to the warning of God when Noah and his family entered the ark. Just another example. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. The reward, what was his reward? Was the saving of his house. The requirement was this. He was moved with fear and prepared an ark. That was the requirement. For the rest of the world, they felt not the urgency. They, they, they never heard of rain, they never saw rain. They didn't feel the urgency to do this. <clears throat> they didn't feel the urgency to come into the ark. For the rest of the world, they felt not the urgency until it was too late. And the door of the ark was closed. And all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. You see how naturally, this is a natural thing, the one follows the other. The reward follows the requirement. Right? If you want the reward, you have to fulfill the requirement. Our topic for today is happy. Are, and I'm going to ask the question, are you happy? Such a feeling is a feeling in which all seek, yet few find. There is our topic, yet there is also our text. Our text is found, and we ask you to turn, I ask you to turn to John 13, and I not? The Gospel of John, chapter 13. It's found in verse 17. It's found in verse 17. If you know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Happy are ye if ye do them. Happy is the reward, being happy. Doing these things, whatever the things are he's requiring, is the requirement. You want to be happy, you must fulfill the requirement. For most, there is much knowledge of duty, yet there's so little of, of the doing. There's a lot of knowledge of, of duty, yet there's so little in, in the doing. When you get up out of, your, out, out of bed in the morning, what would be the very first thing you should do? What would be the natural thing to do? You get out of bed. What's your first duty? Say good morning to the Lord. You get up out of your bed, so you don't even know your duties. What's the first duty? You got up out of bed. You put your feet on the floor. You arose. You stood up. What should you do? Say it loud. Anybody know what to do? I did it since I was a little kid. Make the bed. Make the bed. But when they might say, well, why? I'm just going to crawl 
line at You see, there you know what to do, but you don't do your duty. You don't do your duty. Such a feeling is a feeling which all seek, yet few find. Our topic, yet there's in our text, if you know these things, happy are if you do them. That's the reward. Happy is the reward, doing these things is the requirement. For most, there's much knowledge of duty, yet there's so little in the doing of it. It is knowing the words of Christ, I know the words of Christ, and disregard, and you disregard the works of Christ. You know the words of Christ, but you disregard then the works of Christ. You know what to do, but you don't fulfill it. Admiring the word is not the same as acting on the word. You can admire the word, but you must act on the word. And if one act on the word, they will acquire what the word promises. You must believe that if you do the requirement, you will receive the reward that is promised. If you know these things, our text, happy are ye if you do them. If I then, your Lord and Master, is, this is the foot washing, folks. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet. And I don't feel led to read the account of the foot washing. We all know about it. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Remember, the servant is not greater than his Lord. These are verses that are out of this text. The servant is not greater than his Lord. I mean, you're not too good to do this. He said, you're not greater than I am. You, you've got to do what I do. If the master stoops so low as to perform this humble act, his disciples must surely do the same. The servant is not above his Lord. The immersion of the feet and the wiping them clean is basically this, to forgive and to forget. That's what it is, to forgive them of their sins. To forgive and to forget. To forget wrongdoing on a daily basis, to be done each and every day, is to help, it is to help our brethren and receive help from them. To live in true peace is when every one of the church's members becomes a servant to one another. <clears throat> Washing your own feet as well as others is to promote purity in themselves and others. Right? It's not for salvation. He said you're clean. But not everywhere, because daily you pick up this mud when you walk around in your daily sins and the way you are. Christ taught not only by doctrine, he taught this by doctrine, but also by doing this. He did this. Let us do the same, for Christ said, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. When a Christian does not, as his Savior says, they become as a Pharisee. Now, I say this again. When a Christian does not, as his Savior says, won't do it, they become as a Pharisee. For Christ said of them, do not after their works, for they say, they say, and do not. They say, but they don't do it. I'll read our text. I'll read it over a lot. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. I say such things here today to jog your memory, to refresh your mind, to remind you of your mission, to purify your motive and put it into motion. So the idea is I sat, I sat back there and I said, what, what if it were I sitting there? What would, uh, you know, they, they would say it in class. They, they say it in, you, know, you want to find out how you preach? Want to find out how you preach? We'll tape record it. And then play it back. And you say, man, why would anybody want to listen to that guy? <laughs> what happens to be you, buddy? And they say, tape record yourself and see if you're willing to listen to it yourself. I hope you're willing today. 
I hope you're willing today to put your duty into doing so that ye be happy if ye do them. Who here doesn't want to be happy? Well, I don't like this path to happiness. Well, then you really don't want to be happy, folks. You really don't want to be happy. What was said of widows who deserve honor? I'll read the, I'll read the verse. Well reported, this is about a widow. She needs to be well reported of for good works. If she had brought up children, if she had lodged strangers, if she had washed the saints' feet, If she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good word. I've heard this said here. Now you get this. Get this. Let's get this. I don't even believe they're Christians. I don't even believe they're a Christian. Well, they're being a Christian isn't dependent upon what you believe. But it's dependent upon what they believe. Amen. A person's being a Christian isn't dependent on what others think. It's dependent upon what they believe. Whom say ye that I am? asked Christ. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen? If we were to do a literal foot washing, if we were to do that, here and perform it as if it were an ordinance of the church. And throw this out. Let's say it was an ordinance for Baptists, and it is not. And let's say this was the day we were going to do our, they do it annually, they, they do a minimum, those that have it as an ordinance, they do it as an uh, annual event, and usually it's around Easter. They do this foot washing. And they do it uh, annually. I don't think there's, I don't know, they, that's when I was in the men. They, they only did it once a year. But if we were to do a literal foot wash, and we announced, and everybody knows it's today, today, this day. If we were to do a literal foot washing here and perform it as if we were, nor it was an ordinance of the church and we pair off men with men and women with women. What would most all of us have done before we had arrived here today? <laughs> What would we have done? Every last person here would have washed their feet. Come on, you know that's true. Now there may be an exception, one or two. But if you knew it, you would have washed your feet. Wash our feet, for we have been too ashamed to come with dirty feet. And you would have, I probably wouldn't have worn my cowboy boots to, to uh, store up the stink in there. I would have worn something that would have you know, gotten rid of the odor. You know? But our Lord gives no forewarning. He did it spur of the moment. And he is about, he, he, no forewarning that he's about to wash the disciples' feet, but washes them without any warning. And why? Because he knew their feet were dirty. And may we expect the same. The brethren's feet are dirty. They're dirty. Washing another's feet is to seek their benefit. Folks, we, we did that foot washing here and uh, we had volunteers. I, mean, I probably was dumb enough to ask for volunteers. And we had this one guy, he had come here, he came here, uh, I still see him in town, we're still friends. I was a, he was an enemy of mine and became a friend of mine again. And he used to be here and wander in here all, all the time. And, uh, and he volunteered for the foot washing. We, I took his shoes off and I put them... Uh, we had to wash his feet last. 
We had to wash his feet last. You could even distinguish his toes. You couldn't even tell there were toes there. That's how bad it was. You put it in there, the, all the water became brown and black. I think I, right away, I skipped, skipped him and went and, and, to make sure that we were going to do him last. Because after that got washed, I don't think the next guy wanted to put his feet in the water. Because we only used one tub. Washing one another's feet is to seek their benefit. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. I'll read that again. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. So washing another's feet is for their benefit. It is a labor of love which you show towards the name of Christ and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. We are to do as our Lord did. For the disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect. Quote a verse, but everyone that is perfect. Do you want to be perfect? Do you want to be perfect? But everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. You want to be perfect? Then wash one of those feet. As I said of the church, some other week, in some other sermon, in the Song of Solomon, it says, I have washed my feet. In reference to the church, I have washed my feet. Saved, are you saved? Then haven't you become the sons of God? You become the sons of God? Well then, and I usually yell it, but I'll say it real softly. Well then, act. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have loved one to another. Also found in John 13. Yeah. You might say, yeah. But you don't know the half of it. See, you, preacher, you don't even know the half of it. Well, then, let, let's ask yourself a question. So then ask yourself, so. Did God love us? For God so loved the world. We don't have to quote the rest of the verse, John 3, 16. God so loved the world. And God didn't know the half of it. He knew all of it. See, God doesn't know the half of it. He knew all of it. Amen. All of the sin. Loving one another is perfection. And there's nothing wrong with preaching perfection. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. <clears throat> Christ must have been the happiest man that ever lived. He must have been the happiest man that ever lived. For he humbled himself and washed away the sin of the whole world. Amen. He must have been the happiest man in the whole world. The washing of the disciples' feet is a lesson in which our Lord teaches us. It is a lesson in which he hopes we will learn. The only way to learn the lesson, ever issue a lesson to somebody, <laughs> then you've got to practice the lesson. If you don't practice the lesson, you don't practice the lesson, you won't learn. If you don't practice the lesson. The only way to learn the lesson is to practice the lesson. Our text, if you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. What saith James? But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. 
And what is the blessing in this particular deed? What's the blessing? Happy. That's the blessing, happiness. Happy are ye if you do them. Is happiness a blessing? Yes. And how does one receive a blessing? Blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Amen. Luke eleven twenty eight. What is necessary for one to be happy? What's necessary for a person to be happy? To hear the word of God, to believe the word of God, and to obey the word of God. Christ said, my sheep hear my voice. You know it is the voice of God, the voice of Christ, when Christ says, if you know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Folks, these are not my words, these are Jesus' words. You might say, but, but I can't do them. I cannot do these things. I cannot wash their feet. I can't do it. Well, naturally, that leads me to another verse. But praise be to God, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. So it is not I which doeth such things, but Christ which worketh through me. Are we not his workmanship created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them? And if we are commanded to wash one another's feet, then it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. For we are to do all things without murmurings and disputings. Doesn't all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose? His purpose is that ye be happy. The all things are the things we are commanded to do. That is, wash one another's feet. And it will be a good thing, but it's only for those that love God. Amen. But you may say, but I love God. And I say, if such be true, then do as John commands. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. What is the deed? If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. The Lord truly wants you to be happy. He has paved a way for you to be such. Folks, the road is paved to happiness. Happiness is defined by good fortune and pleasure. Hey, brothers and sisters, we're almost to say, let us pray so we can all wake up. For a word, huh? Oh, Pastor Tucker, that was a good Irish sermon. It's paved the way for you to be such. Happiness is defined by good fortune and pleasure, that which is a feeling of satisfaction and gratification. Happiness is a reward in life, a reward most welcomed and desired by all. Yet like all rewards in life, there always, always must be the requirement to receive the reward. The example that if he would not work, if any would not work, neither should he eat. So if one wants the reward, reward one must fulfill the requirement. The reward is eating. The requirement is working. We're on the last page, brothers. Sounds simple, doesn't it? Because it is. And it's quite practical. The urgency of the reward dictates the fulfilling of the requirement. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Everlasting life is the reward, and believeth on the Son is the requirement. But for most, they possess only the knowledge of the requirement. Knowledge of the requirement is a far cry from the receiving of the reward. 
but the order of requirement and reward holds true. It is of a natural order. The reward follows the requirement. The reward is given when the requirement is fulfilled. Amen. Happy is our topic. The title is happy with a question mark, like, happy? Are you happy? Happy is our topic. Are you happy? You want to be happy? Do you feel the urgency so the reward outweighs the requirement? And if you know these things, happy are you if you do them. Best regards in Christ, your pastor, G.T.